evening, everyone. I'm Kyuk Shin, uh, Director of Schorenstein uh, Asia Pacific uh, Research Center here at Stanford. Thank you all for joining us uh, at the 2023 Schorenstein Journalism Award Ceremony. It's uh, really my pleasure to welcome you to APAC's 22nd, uh, 22nd Annual Awards uh, Celebration. We established uh, Schorenstein Journalism Awards to honor the legacy of our center's uh, benefactor and mentor, uh, Mr. Walter H. Uh, Schorenstein, and his twin passions, uh, promoting excellence in journalism and understanding of uh, in Asia. In his uh, lifetime, uh, Walter cherished uh, these award ceremonies among many other APAC events that he hosted and attended. We fondly remember, remember him and are grateful for the support of the Schorenstein family. The Schorenstein Award is an annual acknowledgement of exceptional journalists who have made significant contribution to enhancing the public understanding of the intricacies of Asia. Uh, this award uh, alternates uh, between recipients affiliated with the American news media and those uh, primarily affiliated with the Asian uh, news outlets. Honorees in the latter category uh, frequently operate on the front lines in the ongoing struggle to safeguard press freedom and advance democracy in their communities. Our past awardees uh, include uh, Maria Ressa, Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureate, and the founder and executive editor of the Philippine news uh, platform, uh, Rappler. Sue Win, a courageous champion of press freedom, uh, human rights defender, and the chief editor of the news outlet, uh, Myanmar Now, and last year's honoree, uh, Emily Fong, uh, NPR's international correspondent who has produced outstanding immersive reporting on China under the extremely harsh circumstances. Okay, this evening, uh, we are honored to confer the 2023 Schoenstein Awards on the Caravan, uh, India's uh, premier magazine of long-form narrative journalism for its exhaustive uh, reportage, commentary, and investigation, and for demonstrating unwavering commitment to truth-telling amid the challenges of India's democratic erosion and declining press freedom. In its first uh, iteration in the 1940s, the caravan stood as a prominent general interest magazine. It relaunched in 2010 as India's first long-form journal of politics and culture. Over the last decade, it has courageously chronicled the sense of political Hinduism uh, in the country holding power to account and maintaining editorial independence. Despite facing threats of violence and incarceration, the caravan and its reporters have conducted you know, vital investigations and published in-depth stories and daring commenta commentaries delving into issues ranging from Hindu uh, supremacist uh, policies and actions to political assassinations, caste and gender injustice, ethnic violence against the Muslim minority, labor disputes, environmental degradation, and the human toll of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Through these uh, endeavors, the magazine's team of dedicated editors and reporters demonstrate the highest level of journalistic integrity and excellence. So we are so delighted to present the Shurensen Awards to and, and, and hear from Hartoshi Singh Bar uh, here today. 
the caravans are exec executive editor, a talented journalist, and perceptive commentator on Indian politics and society. We are so happy to have you today here. Hartoshi was formerly the caravans uh, political editor for 10 years. He has worked with several Indian publications and has written for the New York Times, The Guardian, and Foreign Affairs, among others. Uh, trained as an engineer and, and mathematician, it, it's quite amazing. <laughs> he is an author of Waters uh, Close Over Us, A Journey Along the Narmada, I guess it's a river, right? And the co-author of A Certain Ambiguity, A Mathematical Novel. I'm looking forward to uh, your insight uh, into the state of media and democracy in India and uh, to the following discussion with our uh, distinguished uh, panelists uh, here uh, you know, today. So following uh, Hartoshi's comments, uh, he'll join Northwestern University Professor of Journalism, Kalyani Chada, uh, here, and Stanford uh, political scientist, my colleague, uh, Larry Diamond, uh, in a conversation with uh, Raju uh, Narisetti, uh, a member of the judging committee uh, for this award. And we will follow with a short Q&A session uh, with the audience. And we are so happy to have all of you uh, here with us today. I'd like to uh, extend my appreciation to our four other judges. Uh, here with us today, uh, Jay Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, he is a Hearst Professor of Communications and Chair of the Department of Communication and Director of Journalism Program at Stanford University. There are three more uh, juries who couldn't join us today. Uh, William Dobson, uh, co-editor of the Journal of Democracy, and our five field uh, Asia-Pacific editor, the Washington Post, and she was our 2018 uh, Schoenstein Journalism Award winner, and Louisa Lim, a senior lecturer, audiovisual journalism culture and communication at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Okay, before we proceed, uh, please note that uh, no video recording, uh, no video recording is allowed uh, throughout this session. So please do not record uh, any session. And also, uh, during maybe our conversation, there may be some uh, politically sensitive topics, so that uh, during Q and A. Uh, please respect you know, other views, even though uh, you may not agree with uh, you know, that view. Uh, we are at university, uh, we agree to disagree and respect uh, different views and, and political uh, perspective. Okay, now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Raju uh, Narusetti, uh, representing the Schorenstein Award Jury, to join me on stage to present the award to Caravan and uh, Hartoshi. So Raju uh, is the global publishing leader at McKinsey. Throughout his uh, long career in media, Raju has created, uh, reimagined, and managed top-tier media organizations in North America, Europe, and Asia, has been on the front lines of uh, digital transformation challenges and opportunities in publishing. He was also a professor of professional practice at Columbia University uh, School of Journalism. So here's our flag. Uh, we are so happy to present uh, this year's uh, award to Caravan and Thank you. Thank you. So this award comes with some cash and at the either <laughs> We'll send you a check or we'll wire <laughs> to your account. <laughs> uh, but congratulations, Hartoshi, and the stage is yours now. Thank you. So please welcome. Yeah. Good afternoon. And I'm grateful to the audience that's here today on what is evidently a working afternoon. Mm. I know that I speak against the backdrop of events the horror of events in Israel and the Gaza. And I think at such a time, uh, there is little reason to stress the importance of journalism. Uh, our views, our knowledge, our opinions, 
our uh, sense of what is happening there is being shaped by journalism. And at times of crisis, I think there is very little reason to stress that this becomes a fundamental tool for understanding the world. And in this attention on a crisis, sometimes you forget that there are other aspects to journalism as well. I personally think one of the other main guiding posts of journalism is to warn us of perils that lie ahead, to warn us against tragedies that await us. And uh, it is in this mode that I'm going to talk today, not perhaps about perils that await us or perils that lie ahead, but perils that have already unfolded in India, but are not completely realized outside India. The knowledge of what has happened there is lacking for many outside India. Uh, I want to begin on the subject first by thanking the Schorenstein Center for the award, for the honor that has been conferred on us. And I think uh, the names that you named, the names that have preceded us gave us a good sense of the degree of the honor that has been bestowed on us. And I deliberately use the term us because I stand here as representative of an institution, the caravan. Uh, journalism is often seen as a task of individuals, of bylines, of investigative reporters. But in the end, it is an activity sustained through institutions with commitment to certain values. Without such institutions, there is no journalism that survives. The caravan is one such institution. The values that we are committed to are simple values of uh, rigor, of veracity, and maybe a commitment to examine the exercise of power, whoever possesses it. Uh, this should be something ordinary, something commonplace, something taken for granted. In India today, this is no longer the case. Uh, the number of organizations that would be subsumed under the term journalism is tiny. And this at a time when we have a very large private media. I think private media under the term media is thriving in India as it has never before. Mm. In terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the technology, in terms of the studios, in terms of the number of journalists, or number of employees. I will not use the term journalist in this context. But every evening at prime time, or in the editorials of uh, Hindi and English newspapers and uh, television channels, I'm not talking of the South, but this covers a billion people out of the 1.4 billion people in India. What we hear is hatred, bigotry, a criticism of anybody who wants to stand by the institutions that enable the functioning of a democracy. There is no sense of uh, rigor. There is no commitment to veracity. And certainly there is no questioning of power. In fact, there is an amplification of power of the government that today exercises it. This is not a surprise. This did not change in 2014 when the current government or the current Prime Minister Narendra Modi came to power. But it has been exacerbated and magnified. The first reason is that the Indian media is largely owned by conglomerates who have a huge number of business interests. And India is a semi-liberalized economy. And if the media is a small part of your business interests, the losses you tend to run because of government displeasure ensure that you fall in line and do what the government requires you to do. But that's not the end of the story. A large amount of traditional media and new media is also owned largely by people from the mercantile castes, one of the upper castes of Hinduism. And most of them are committed to the ideological project of the current government. So in some senses, what we are seeing in the media is a coming together both of financial interest and ideological control. And this makes uh, the entire environment contaminated. The number of journalist organizations in these languages are but a handful left today. Uh, the other organizations may 
present the facade of journalism, but they are media organizations doing propaganda for the government. And it is in this context I want to say that this is representative of India as a whole, that uh, the values that we assume drive governance in a constitutional democracy, the values, however flawed they may have been, under which Narendra Modi came to power in 2014, are not the values that are driving governance in India today. Those values come from elsewhere, and they represent a significant change, so much of a change that I would state quite categorically that the country that was India in 2014 is not the same country that exists today in 2023. How did we come to this point? How did this come to pass? I, it requires me to go back in history. It requires me to go back almost 100 years to 1925 to the founding of an organization called the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS. Why do I stress this? Our current Prime Minister Narendra Modi began his career, his public involvement with the RSS. He was 20 years old at that time. For the next 14 years, he was with the RSS. At that point, he was deputed to its political wing, the BJP, or the party that governs the country today. The values that underline the worldview of Narendra Modi, the values that the ruling government today represents are the values of the RSS. To understand what is driving the country today, we need to know a little and more about the RSS. It was founded in 1925 by five people, the chief among them, a man named K.B. Hedgevar, who was a former congressman. He broke away from the Congress because he was upset with the trajectory the freedom struggle had taken under Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, who had brought Hindus and Muslims together in the fight against colonialism. For Hedgevar, Muslims were, and this is a term he used, Yavna snakes. Yavna is the Indian word for Greek, but is used for foreigners in general. For him, there was need to consolidate Hindu society against this threat, not against colonialism, but this threat by Yavna snakes. <laughs> The one problem he faced at this point of time is that what is the society he needed to organize? The term Hindu is a notoriously difficult one to categorize. And Hedgevar ran into the same problem. For his definition of the Hindus that the RSS represents, he turned to the work of a man named V.D. Savarkar, who is today glorified in India today. His portrait hangs in parliament. And to be fair, at one point of time, he was battling against colonialism and was jailed. In jail, he turned, wrote several mercy petitions to the British, uh, promised undying allegiance to the empire. And when he was finally released, he lived true to this promise for the next 30 years of his life. Till his death, he did not write a single word against colonialism. He did write one book. He had another contribution. He was one of the chief mentors to a man named Nathuram Godse, who 30 years later was to assassinate Gandhi. This man, the book he wrote, was a book called Hindutva or Hinduness. And it attempted to define the term Hindu in the following way. And I'm simplifying this, but this is essentially how the RSS understands it. That the Hindu is somebody who considers the geography of India, both as his motherland and holy land. Savarkar actually had used the term fatherland, but the RSS preferred the term motherland. It's a succinct definition, but it's important what it leaves out. Because the emphasis on holy land is meant to exclude Muslims and Christians. People who think of Jerusalem or Mecca as a holy land cannot belong to this idea of Hinduness. For the RSS, this was important. And for Savarkar, this cultural definition became a basis for a larger way of thinking which extended, in his view, beyond religion, because he was atheist. He was an atheist. The RSS was not. Uh, Savarkar also stressed the descent from a single race of the Hindus. And 
please remember the time we are talking of. We are talking of the ideas of fatherland and race in the 1920s, early 30s. The echo of Europe is clear. The echo of Italy and Germany is clear in this. Uh, the RSS sent a delegation of its senior leaders, including one of its founders, to meet Mussolini in Italy, to learn from him, to see how the country was organized. At the same time, a young ideologue was emerging in the RSS. His name was M.S. Golwalkar. He was to become its most prominent ideologue. He was to head this organization for 30 years. His importance can be gauged by the fact that in 2007, when our current Prime Minister Narendra Modi wrote a book called Jewels of Light, he profiled 16 people from the RSS who had inspired him. The longest chapter was on Golwalkar. And the title of the chapter was this Supreme Guru who was worthy of worship. Uh, the Supreme Guru's ideas of what constitutes a Hindu nation are of great interest because he elaborated the work of Savarkar. And I will just read out two passages because I think it is best to hear it in Golwalkar's words, the words that underlie the values of the RSS, the words and the values that drive India today. Golwalkar writes, to keep up the purity of the race and its culture, Germany shocked the world by her purging the country of the Semitic races, the Jews. Race pride at its highest has been manifested here. Germany has also shown how well nigh impossible it is for races and cultures, having differences going to root, to be assimilated into one united whole, a good lesson for us in Hindustan to learn and profit by. Having endorsed the final solution, Golwalkar tries to create a place for these minorities, the Hindus and the Christians and Muslims. And he goes on to say, and again, note the emphasis on races as well. The foreign races in Hindustan must either adopt the Hindu culture and language, must learn to respect and hold in reverence Hindu religion, must entertain no idea but those of the glorification of the Hindu race and culture, that is, of the Hindu nation, and must lose their separate existence to merge in the Hindu race, or may stay in the country, wholly subordinated to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, deserving no privileges, far less any preferential treatment, not even citizens' rights. This is the defining creed of the RSS from its most prominent ideologue and leader. Of course, at the time this was formulated, the RSS was mar marginal in Indian political life. It was at odds with the Indian freedom struggle, so it was no surprise that when the Indian Constitution was discussed and adopted in 1950 after India's independence, the RSS contributed nothing to this document. This document was written by, by men like Ambedkar, one of India's foremost political leaders, himself a Dalit from one of India's lowest castes. He had educated himself to the point where he went to Columbia. He was a student of John Dewey. The imprint of American constitutionalism is directly present in the Indian constitution through people like Ambedkar. And what, what did this constitution say as the values that underlie modern India? That India was a compact between its citizens who have agreed to come together in a republic with shared values of guaranteed rights, of equal treatment of all citizens, of special protection for minorities, linguistic, religious, or cultural, or, and finally, an affirmative action program that sought to undo the injustice, the central injustice of Indian society, of the caste system that has pervaded Indian society for at least 1,500 years. This was the vision, the vision that pervaded India imperfectly and sometimes espoused hypocritically, but yet underlay its institutions 
this was the constitution on the basis of which Narendra Modi was elected in 2014 as part of the BJP government. But what has happened since? Let me just give you a few illustrations that should explain what has happened. Today, over 300 legislators in Indian parliament belong to the BJP, to Narendra Modi's party, out of 540. That's a complete majority. Not one of them is a Muslim. The Muslims are 15% of India's population. That's a population of 200 million people at least, larger than the population of most countries on earth. They are without a representative in the ruling party that governs power in the country, that runs the union cabinet, that decides the legislature, that passes law, that discusses the future of India. This lack of representation is deliberate. The BJP chooses not to award seats to Muslims, or if it does award a few seats to contest to Muslims, it is in areas where it is sure it is going to lose. This marginalization in political power in a supposed representative democracy is accompanied by an actual situation on the ground. The first is ghettoization. Increasingly, it is difficult today for Muslims to rent or buy property in Hindu majority areas. This is part legislative through new laws enacted, old laws reinterpreted, but it is also part of a social consensus of a large majority of the society which prefers to keep Muslims out of such neighborhoods. What does that mean? The best schools, colleges, parks, sports facilities, all of these lie in Hindu majority areas. Uh, the access to services. All this is leading to a further ghettoization of a community. Uh, remember what Golwalkar has said, they should be denied even citizens' rights. It is being lived out. Uh, but beyond this, lack of power, ghettoization, is the creation of fear. Uh, there was always Hindu-Muslim conflict, local riots in which Hindus and Muslims were killed ever since independence. Since 2014, we have seen a new trend. Dozens of lynchings of Muslims have taken place. These lynchings seem to occur at random. They have occurred inside a train, on an open street, outside a Muslim's house. They occur with a lack of sense that makes them more dangerous because as far as Muslims are concerned, any of them tomorrow can be stopped and killed and lynched on the streets for reasons they cannot even comprehend. What is the pretext for most of these lynchings? The pretext is that they are in possession of beef, they are connected to the slaughter of the cow. The people leading the mobs who carry out these lynchings are largely directly or ideologically affiliated with the RSS. They have taken videos of themselves carrying out these killings, posted them on social media. They have gained in local prominence through participating in such killings. And what has the police done? The police has not pursued justice in the manner it should because the police understands what the signal of political power is. These are not equal citizens. They are not participants in the process of justice of the state. They are less than citizens. And so justice is not available to those citizens in India. And this is the current state in which these cases lie in almost all of the incidents that have happened. This then is the India that is living out a vision which is not constitutional, but a vision which had been enshrined by the RSS over 70 or 80 years ago. Our next, our next elections are coming up in 2024, but even more important is the year that comes after 2025. It's 100 years of the RSS. Perhaps we will move from a de facto to a very real realization from the idea of the Hindu nation to celebrate the anniversary, celebrate it is the term they would use, of the RSS. This claim to power 
which is ideological, also serves political interests in an electoral sense for the BJP. The direction of hatred towards a minority has served as a means of consolidating political power among the Hindus. Increasingly, the definition of Hinduism, though it is vast, is being restricted to how the RSS defines it. And the external hatred of the Muslim consolidates the fractures and fissions within Hindus. The project, however imperfectly realized, of undoing the injustice of the caste system that began at independence and in slow stuttering ways did manage to achieve more than had been achieved in the last 1,500 years is being undone because an external hatred is one way of keeping existing structures intact. So for the first time, we are seeing that upper caste percentages in the union cabinet of ministers holding key posts are once again going increasingly to the upper castes. Uh, what is the percentage of upper caste population in India? It was a question that had not been easily answered. Uh, no caste census had taken place since the 1930s. But just recently, in the state of Bihar, a caste census was taken, and it turns out that the upper caste population is about 15% of the population. This 15% of the population has control over power resources. I mentioned the mercantile castes who run businesses, corporates, including India's new startups, including information technology. The same 15%, if you count the Indians in Silicon Valley, they would form maybe 90% of the Indians here. This control over resources, financial, and this degree of intellectual hegemony perhaps was rivaled only in apartheid South Africa. I'm choosing my terms with great care. And even there, at its height, the white population was more than the upper caste population is in India today. And this is going unchallenged, and it is consolidating. Given all this, one would assume that there should be a government that should be fairly secure in itself but a government that drives an external threat and is worried about dissipation from within of Hindu consolidation must use everything in the rule books of autocracies to pursue its claim to power. I was this afternoon thinking of citing several incidents to show how media, civil society, etc., have been subjugated in India. And uh, I met Larry Diamond today in the afternoon. He presented me with his book. And on page 64 or 65, there is a checklist, a checklist of a 12-step program. And I'll just read out the 12-step program, because I'll tell you that how many of these are today already lived out in India. And it is interesting because in 2019, as I went through this book, you were still wondering whether Modi would play out this rule book or not. In the next four years, begin to demonize the opposition as illegitimate and unpatriotic. Check. The opposition is anti-national. It supports China. Yeah. Undermine the independence of the courts. Uh, I will skip this one because in India, even the truth is not defense against contempt. I'd rather not run the risk of saying what I really think. <laughs> Number three is attack the independence of the media. I've already spoken about it. There is almost no independence left of the media. The handful of the media organizations that I speak of that do journalism are reaching a few million people in a country of 1.4 billion. The rest of the media is what everybody watches and uses to form their opinion gain control of any public broadcasting, that public broadcasting in India was always the government's job. It was propaganda. Impose stricter controls of the internet, check. Google, Facebook, Twitter, everybody has had to fall in line according to Indian law. We've had this happen to us. Uh, Facebook and Twitter can be under Indian law, asked to take down specific content. You will not 
know in the US that a certain tweet has been pulled down. It is pulled down only for the Indian region under law, so Indians are not able to see. Twitter accounts, tweets, it's happened once to our Caravan account as well. And there is no explanation for why it happens. All the organizations tell us is that on the demands of the government, such and such was taken out. Subdue other elements of civil society. Amnesty and Greenpeace have been thrown out of India. Civil society members have been jailed uh, under the most frivolous of pretexts. From what it seems clear today, forensic evidence has been planted on their devices to put them in jail, and they continue to be jailed in five or six months. Intimidate the business community, I've spoken about it. Enrich a new class of crony capitalists, check. One of Modi's close partners is a man named Adani, who has become one of India's biggest industrialists over the past 15, 20 years. Most of India's ports, airports, etc., are under his control. Assert political control over the civil service and security apparatus. The military has been politicized in a manner that has never been true of India. It was one of the things we felt separated us from Pakistan, the lack of political involvement of the military. Gain control over the body that runs the elections. Yes, increasingly true. What we had was an election commission that we were justly proud of. Today, it has become, again, an extension of the government. Repeat step 1 to 11, even more vigorously, deepening citizens' fear of opposing or criticizing the new political order. That's India today. So there is this rule book of autocracy, and there is this ideological project that makes, I personally believe, unique in the right-wing turn towards the world. This, I think, is something the world still is to realize. When somebody like Biden says that we share values of a democracy, I think either he's being hypocritical or does not understand the extent of what has happened in India. This roughly is what I wanted to talk about. I think some of the other questions will come up in the discussion. After this. Thank you. Thank you, Hatosh. Uh, depressing, <laughs> but let's talk about it in a, in a bit. Uh, I wanted to uh, actually introduce our two um, panelists a little bit more as well. Uh, Kalyani Chadda is an uh, associate professor of journalism at uh, Medell School at Northwestern. And we are delighted to have her here because her focus of a lot of her work has been on a couple of fronts. One is understanding the structural changes that might happen in countries like India and other parts of Asia and what that does to journalism. And two, a deep look at um, alternative news sources uh, in countries where the mainstream media, as Hartosh was saying, is fully co-opted. And then uh, we have Larry Diamond, who is the uh, senior fellow in global democracy here at Stanford, holds way too many appointments in way too many places here um, uh, at the Freeman Sparkly Institute, at Hoover Institution. But uh, also delighted to have him because, um, as Hartosh talked about, uh, Larry has written a lot about um, democracies, but he's also actually focused a lot on India, starting way back in 2007, Larry, the first time you wrote about um, State of India's democracy is coincidentally working on um, updating the State of India's democracy. That book comes out hopefully next year. Uh, so in a way, we have uh, a panel that is very well suited to talk about um, what uh, Hartosh la laid out a little bit. Um, Larry, I want to start with you. A lot of what Hartosh talked about um, is not new in the sense that democratically elected leaders in Hungary or Turkey and other places have turned very nationalist and have taken on very autocratic tendencies. How would you describe the state of India's democracy today? Clearly, the current government is elected by a significant majority, as Hartosh talked about. Um, so they have consent, seemingly, from most of the voting Indians. 
but how would you describe the state of India's democracy? Well, uh, in a word, uh, and it is the word that is in the title of the book uh, that I have edited that's coming out next year with the University of Michigan Press with Shumit Ganguly, and I see my co-editor there, uh, Densha Mystery, uh, so I'll call him out as well, Troubling. The title is The Troubling State of India's Democracy. The severely diminished state of India's democracy could be another way of framing it, and another could be the questionable or, um, you know, historical and no longer existing state of India's democracy. Uh, it is the case that, uh, as I mentioned to the three of you earlier, the one of the best annual ratings projects uh, in, in terms of closely studying and annually evaluating. Uh, the degree of democracy in countries, the Varieties of Democracy uh, project um, in Sweden has downgraded uh, India to the status of a non-democracy. And uh, I think you could make, I mean, what is a democracy? A democracy is a political system in which people can choose and replace their leaders in free and fair elections. It's not enough uh, for a country to be democracy that if you were to able to poll every individual, uh, the ruling party would indeed have majority support. If the majority support is in part grotesquely manufactured uh, through an unlevel playing field in which the ruling party massively controls the media uh, and the entire information and ideological sphere in which businesses fear, and we know <laughs> if you talk to them in private, they do fear to support any opposition party because they could be wiped out. You know, one of the features of uh, what we call a competitive authoritarian regime, a regime that has the formal architecture of democracy, all of the other boxes you could check, multi-party elections, check. Something on paper that says constitutional court, check. Something on papers that says uh, the election commission of India, check. Uh, you know, uh, something on paper that says the independent civil service, check. You have the formal architecture of democracy, but beneath that is the deeper uh, reality of Fear, pervasive fear uh, of self-censorship, of uh, an inability to hold government accountable, and the evisceration, the gradual suffocating evisceration of independent institutions. And when that goes on to a certain point, what you say is that democracy has declined in quality and it has become less liberal. And we could debate how liberal Indian democracy ever was, but it had many liberal, vibrant qualities to it. And the vibrancy of civil society, the independence of the media, the pluralism of um, intellectual argument, the independence of universities, which is also being strangled. We haven't even talked about that yet, and the intimidation and victimization of individual intellectuals, you know, there, there was a great vibrancy there. The minimum that is obvious is that India is a deeply diminished and dramatically less pluralistic democracy than it was, and a democracy that is now uh, uh, committing on a daily basis. Uh, Hartosh barely scratched the surface uh, of um, the violations systematic violations of human rights and civil liberties, including the civil liberties of 200 million people who are part of a religious uh, minority of the country. And that isn't the only religious minority in India that's being victimized. But at a certain point, you have to ask the question of whether um, the ideological project and the power imbalance has proceeded so far that there is no longer 
the minimally level playing field that is required for a country to be a democracy. And this is where I will confess, uh, Dinsha will remember when we were having our conference, we did not have co a consensus among the participants in our own uh, edited project and our own uh, workshop discussions about whether India had fallen below the line or was just above the line still in terms of having the minimal conditions of democracy. We had a consensus about what the trajectory was and we all find it alarming. Uh, but after a certain point, you know, the trajectory proceeds and you, you look at Venezuela, you look at Turkey, you look at Hungary, uh, you look at El Salvador, which, where this has happened very rapidly, and other countries, and you know, the longer that these hegemonic, um, abusive, personalistic, um, and uh, demonizing of minorities, ruling parties, stay in power, the project just continues. It doesn't reach some uh, state of, okay, now we've done what we want and we'll respect the mineral, minimal rights of democracy. I'll just close by saying, I think a case could be made until the elections next May uh, to renew the uh, mandate of parliament. A case could be made that it's uncertain because we have had the opposition win some recent elections at the state level, most recently in Karnataka. And um, so you could say, well, even with all of this, the opposition can still win some elections. But I will just close by saying, as a democracy scholar, the presence of the opposition winning some state elections is not validation, in my mind, is not sufficient validation that the system overall is a democracy. Under the PRI in Mexico, the opposition was willing, uh, uh, you know, winning before 1997 some state elections. That didn't make the 60 years of PRI hegemony uh, a, d a democracy in Mexico. And I just pray we're not looking at 60 years of authoritarian hegemony here. So, Kalani, I want to connect this macro conversation to journalism. You've studied, you've been a student of journalism in India and its structures. There's no censorship. It's mostly owned by private, as Hartosh pointed out. There is huge proliferation of channels, and when you turn on Indian television, it seems like anybody can say pretty much anything. And oftentimes, the Indian government points to all of that to say, what's the problem? Everybody seems to have a free, fair voice, and they can say what they want to say. But Hartosh made an interesting point about the ownership of media actually likes the project, as he calls it. So what has fundamentally changed um, 20 years ago to now? Because the Constitution is still the same. There's been no amendment to the Constitution. Seemingly, journalists had a lot of rights before, and now it seems to have been fully co-opted. I'm curious about your take on it. So I would say that I think we have to go back to the Constitution for a second. We like the illusion, I think, that we were always a democratic country with a free press. I'm not so sure about that. I think we, I'm not, I, I don't want to underplay what's happening now. I think Hartog spoke very eloquently about that. But I think the other issue is we have a Constitution that doesn't really provide adequate protection for freedom of speech. It's very much part of a gender, you know, the press has no special status in that setup. And so, you know, there's, there's actually no constitutional structure. And I'm not saying that the American press is great. It has all kinds of problems. So we, I'm, I'm not going to go down the whataboutism kind of path because that, that, that tends to get, you know, brought up sometimes. But I, I think we don't really have a constitutional system that protects the press adequately. So that's one. The other question, I think, is that, you know, the the economic structure of Indian media is, is, on the one hand, you know, yes, there's plenty of choice. Um, there are millions of channels and millions of publications. I think by one count, there are like 17,000 registered public. I mean, you know, you, you can cite those statistics. But at the same time, I think what is really troubling is that, you know, Dainik Bhaskar, the largest circulation Hindi paper, also owns a power plant, a coal washing plant, 
um, you know, and that's just one example of, of what's going on, right? You have political parties and political figures who own television channels. This is very true of regional television in India, for instance. So, you know, what you see really is there are all these structural economic constraints. And then, of course, there is the constant pressure to, to because there are so many um, different kinds of entities, there's also so much competition, which means that you know, survival is, 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 is really the end game. And if your survival is coming from government advertising, which, which is true of a very large number of publications, a very high, I mean, I think uh, Caravan is, a, is, a, is an, an example of really following a different model, but most mainstream media are reliant on advertising. And that means that you're not going to get government advertising if they're very unhappy with you. And this is not just true of the national government, this is also true of state governments. So it doesn't matter who's necessarily in power there. Um, you, you could have the same situation. And so I, I think what we're looking at is a structure which has never been particularly hospitable to really having a particularly free press or having a really expansive public sphere, both constitutionally and in terms of economic structure. And then, of course, there is the, the makeup of newsrooms, which is something that Hartosh was also talking about. Just where, you know, there was a recent study, I think, in 2019 that um, News Laundry and Oxfam did, where you look at, you know, over 80 or almost close to 90 percent of newsroom leaders in India come from the same upper caste. Um, they tend more, they tend by and large to come from the same faith. You know, you have the token Muslim journalist, you have the token Christian journalist, but in general, that's not the case. And for instance, for other work that I'm doing, I've been speaking to um, Dalit journalists who, who actually got a foothold in newsrooms and their experiences when they're trying, tr trying to talk about issues of caste, for example, has been that basically it's, it's really either you get with the program as it were, or it's not something that you can cover. So, so I think there are tremendous structural problems that exist, both in terms of legal structure, in terms of economic structure, and in terms of sort of the, the makeup of these newsrooms, who, who, who gets to have a voice. Hartosh, what is different now? Because the belief always was that you know, India is a federal system. There's a central government. There's different states, different governments sometimes. And even now, lots of states are ruled by, um, as Larry was talking about, non-BJP governments. Um, it felt like in that kind of an environment, there were built-in checks and balances, particularly when it came to media. Because media was always uh, reliant on government advertising. So that hasn't changed over 50 years. What is different about? this particular moment, this particular decade, that makes it very difficult for independent media to actually thrive? Look, two things have happened, I think. Kalyani has already indicated that uh, there were structural problems before Narendra Modi comes to power in 2014. It was not a very robust structure. The Congress itself was very well aware of the weaknesses and how to exploit them. But there were still limits to which it restricted itself. There were many centers of power. There was an interplay between different leaders of the Congress. There were also organizations that lay outside the control of the government. And the last thing, I think, and not enough attention is paid to this phenomena is of uh, weaponizing the public itself against journalism. Mm. And what I mean by that is that part of the Modi phenomenon has been that it is literally the people who support Modi have donned on the jersey of a football team that's Team Modi. And it doesn't matter what Team Modi does, we have to support it. So I have been involved with two very big stories there, the first was the Radia tapes, which we had brought out when I was working for a different organization. The mainstream media suppressed that story. It was about the collusion between business and journalism and power and the formation of governments. But the story came out, went public. This was against the Congress years. It did huge damage to the Congress. But the public read the story and reacted as a public. Five years later, during the Modi era, we did a story of the mysterious death of a judge who was looking into the cases of murder against Modi's home minister, the man in charge of internal security across the country. Uh, when we did that story, again, that story went out. But 
instead of responding to the story, we had to respond to our motivations. Prime time was devoted to the antecedents of my fellow editor, Vinod Joes at the time, my own antecedents. Why were we behaving in this manner? Why are we anti-national? Why are we doing this? The atmosphere was totally different. We were at the receiving end of a lynch mob for doing our jobs. This weaponization of the public, the use of social media, this actually creates a different factor which is beyond just control of ownership and influence there. A lot of the anchors today who are dancing in the studios to the tune of the government are also so dancing because they have today viewerships and public su success in terms of how people react to them that they would have not ever dreamed of if they had done journalism the way journalism was meant to be. So I think all these things have also come together today to create the environment we have. Let's talk a little bit about Caravan. I mean, you have a, what in the US would call a hard paywall, meaning that you have to pay to access it. It's not a lot of money by Western standards, it's like $25 a year, right? sure. 2,000 rupees. Um, but it also, it frees you up from having, you know, being reliant on, but it also does things like it limits the number of people who would access the kind of journalism that you're doing. Talk a little bit about the choices you've had to make uh, in kind of making sure that the, your journalism is financially sustainable. Look, I mean, in the first place, we spoke about ownership structures. In our case, it wouldn't have been possible without an owner backing us right through. And there are exceptions possible because our owners are drawn from the same mercantile cast that other owners are. But they have steadily over the years, it's a three generation publishing house stood against the government brought out Hindu magazines. And so for much of our existence, we were cross subsidized from other Hindi magazines to sustain ourselves. And we've slowly grown a subscription model that works and is breaking us, break, bringing us to the point where we can do journalism without being pressured by the government in any way. But for these very reasons, we remain small. This model is the model that is sustaining journalism today, various organizations like Wired, News Laundry, Scroll. All of them in one way or the other are directly reaching out the reader, to the reader to get money. Uh, but for that very reason, they remain small. In a democracy without the existence of independent mass media, you cannot have the free flow of information that is necessary. We will remain small players, we realize that, but we have no other options. There, till the point that something gives in the politics of India, I do not see the possibility of sustainable large mass media that can play the role that is necessary in a democracy. Larry, you've looked at this play out in other countries as you just pointed out, um, Venezuela, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, have you seen uh, what Hartosh just said? Have you seen kind of the ability for things to change when they're all moving in this kind of a direction where a majority seems to actually like what they're getting from their government? Well, uh, it really varies by country. Uh, take Turkey, which just had an election very recently. Uh, people are saying, oh, surprise, surprise, Erdogan got reelected again. Well, he got reelected in part because he disqualified. Uh, this might have a familiar ring uh, with the case we're talking about. Uh, they disqualified the most uh, prominent opposition politician from running, the mayor of Istanbul. And um, we, there's not enough transparency around the actual administration and counting of elections in Turkey uh, for us to really have confidence that Erdogan actually won the election, even with the uh, much less popular presidential candidate who ultimately was the uh, more or less unified opposition candidate, Kılıç Daroglu. So um, it isn't clear in Hungary, uh, uh, it's a very similar situation to India in many ways. There's just virtually the opposition, you know, has a very tiny little voice compared to the behemoth of the, the of the pro regime media, uh, and we also have to um, acknowledge uh, that uh, the prime minister of Hungary 
and the Prime Minister of Modi are extremely capable, clever, adroit, um, and uh, in a way charismatic politicians. You can't diminish that element of personal politics either. And in the case of, um, of Hungary, uh, he's also been extremely adept at exploiting in very timely fashion fear, fear of the Ukrainian, of the, of the Russian war on Ukraine kind of spilling over into Hungary and destabilizing it. And uh, we could go on and on about the details. Um, but it can also be acknowledged that illiberal populist projects can be halted and reversed. Um, there was some reversal in Slovakia where uh, actually the opposition candidate, a woman, won the presidential election and, and kind of put the brakes on that. Now they've had a more ambiguous recent parliamentary election. And, um, you know, we can point to uh, other incidents of slides toward populism that didn't gather this momentum and didn't become consolidated into competitive authoritarianism. They all have some common features, and one is, uh, I don't know if this is you know, bad news. You can judge by the trajectory of where you think we're at in India today. Early intervention, early, inter early activation of the brakes on the slide, and the brakes on the slide are to a considerable extent the reverse of the 12-step project. It's activating the courts and defending the autonomy of the courts. In Poland, uh, law and justice, the ruling party in Poland hasn't quite succeeded in conquering the constitutional court yet, in part because the European Union has put brakes on what they've tried to do. It's activating the integrity uh, and professionalism of the civil service. And sometimes it's massive mobilization of of civil society, I'll just close by saying, there is a right-wing populist, illiberal, and I think dangerous for democracy project in Israel. I'm not gonna get into how that relates to the, the tragedy of um, uh, Hamas's uh, massive terrorist assault on Israel in the last few days, but the point is that uh, Netanyahu has been restrained in his project, uh, and it isn't clear where that might be headed or where what would have been headed in the absence of this, um, by unprecedented mobilization of civil society. The percentage of Israeli citizens who have come out into the streets every Saturday night for months uh, would translate into India, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of people. So mobilization and awakening of civil society and ordinary individuals can also make a difference. Atosh, obviously most of the mainstream media, as you were pointing out, particularly television and Hindi uh, press and all that, has been co-opted. But at the same time, you see signs of this government going after relatively small players, the most recent example being NewsClick, a website. Um, we were talking earlier about what might happen with uh, uh, Arundhati Roy, not a journalist in the conventional sense, but a writer. Does that actually give us hope that the fact that the government needs to still continue to do this on, uh, means that they are, they're worried about that there could be a turn, or do you just see this as, as Larry was saying, the project will not end at some point and won't stay as still, it'll just continue going? I, I wish I could offer some hope because the way I see it is that the BJP and the current dispensation, even when it is 100% sure of victory, it will do the extra 10 or 20 or 30% that will be necessary to exceed that victory. To me, I see what is happening as the acceleration of a process that was already underway with NewsClick. You want to just... Yeah, it can I, if I may just illustrate what the case is. It is a news portal. Uh, it's clear its leanings are to the extreme left. In terms. Its owners, editors have been arrested under a case of terrorism. 
Uh, the case has been built up after a New York Times report on an American individual named Neville Roy Singer, who is supposedly at the center of a Chinese propaganda machinery. Except that there is no case proceeding against Singham in America. He, as far as I know, he's a free citizen who is not under any question. So what we have is a documented investment by Singham in NewsClick. There is no evidence to show that the Chinese government is directly involved with this or that NewsClick has done anything at the behest of the Chinese government. There are terror cases, and these will proceed for several years. We've already seen that. But far worse, the government has used this pretext to go after over 40 journalists who have either contributed to news click or have been loosely associated with it, who have nothing to do with its source of funding. I'm, this would be to hold a, a Stanford University professor responsible for the funding Stanford has got from somewhere, basically. And, uh, these journalists have been interrogated, some for 12 or 14 hours, by the police. Their laptops and phones have been seized by a government that has, as I had mentioned, already been accused of planting forensic evidence on communication devices. And these journalists, no surprise, include some of India's best investigative journalists, commentators, economic commentators, who have questioned how the government has gone about a number of things, including defense deals. And after that, we hear of the lieutenant governor of Delhi, who reports directly to the central government, which is to Narendra Modi's government, uh, directing the police to go ahead and file a case against Arundhati Roy. The case dates back to a 2010 speech that she gave. There was no reason for it to come up now. For me, it seems clear that the government is moving to a point where it does not care about international reaction because these things will create international reactions. It is clear that it can go after people, it can send internal messages, and not worry about the consequences internationally because the international world order is at such a place that the Indian government feels they have to deal with India come what may. And they do not worry about what the consequences will be outside. Kalani, you've spent a lot of time looking at alternative media in India, and they're small, but they're fairly distributed, and some of them actually have come about in the last few years. What stories are they doing that are not getting told widely, and what stories would you say are we missing about India? Because there's more to India than Modi and BJP and RSS. I think, you know, if, I think we had talked earlier about what was hopeful, because most of our conversation wasn't very hopeful. Um, I think what they're trying to do is a lot of it, at least in the case, um, I think what they're really trying to do is document. So, you know, whether it's cases of lynchings of Muslims, whether it's cases of things that have happened with Dalits, um, you know, and it's not all negative either. I mean, some of it is, you know, just having a place in the world. And I think so much of media representation is some of it is you know issues with negative representation, which is one problem, but there's also complete erasure of whole sets of people. And I think what this alternative media is trying to do is to sort of represent these people, give them a space to articulate their concerns. And you know, when you talk to the journalists who are working in that space, most of them will tell you, I don't know if this changes anything at some massive level, but it is a small space for the articulation of our concerns. It's a space to have a voice. Um, it's a space, it's, it's, it's a way of putting forward what we're, what we're thinking, experiencing. And I, because I think the, main, the biggest problem is the mainstream media, has, has, as Hartosh has been saying. It's like these nothing but Modi or the BJP or whatever exists, right? I mean, that is the main focus, whatever the controversy of the day is. So I think alternative media are trying on a pretty small scale to do, to give people space and give people voice. I don't know how eventually what that works out to being. But I think that's their, the goal for them is just to have this small space, to have this voice, to articulate concerns. It's, it's very, sm you know, I guess small is, is the word that I keep repeating, but, but I think it's just meaningful to them because just the act of being able to represent yourself can sometimes be very powerful in a world where you have no voice and you just don't count. So I'm gonna pick up on the topic of hope and ask a couple of questions, but then come to the audience so have questions, start thinking about them. 
uh, in about five minutes, I'll come to you. The last time we were gathered here in, in person, Hartosh, was uh, uh, when we, the Chernson gave the award to Maria Ressa, who then went on to win the uh, Nobel Prize. Um, the spotlight on the West put on Rappler and her, in some ways probably helped the Philippine government not going all the way. They tried to, and there was too much spotlight on it, and I think she's since won a lot of her cases. I'm hoping that this award, um, I know that you're thinking, is spotlight good or bad? But I'm hoping that this would um, put a spotlight on voices like yours and maybe kind of ensure that you know, they continue. It brings me back to this question of hope, though, and Larry, we've, we've all talked about it earlier. What, should, what can happen that actually might change, especially when it comes to media? Um, have you seen anything? Um, obviously, Hartosh's model has people with the ability to subscribe to Caravan. But have you seen anything that gives you hope? And I'll ask each of you the question in order. So why don't I start with you? What could the West, for example, be doing um, if nothing is happening in India to save this kind of journalism? Well, you asked two questions. What gives you hope? And the second is what um, perhaps can people or actors in the West do? On the first question, what gives me hope in part is that the structure um, and traditions of competitive electoral politics continue. Um, and uh, I think it will be difficult in the near term for the BJP, which let's face it, is highly likely to be returned to power next year at the national level, to create a comprehensive uh, party hegemony. And um, uh, the diversity of, of Indian society, and in many ways, just the vibrancy and initiative um, uh, and creativity of it, culturally and in many other ways, uh, I think there are a lot of hopeful elements uh, in both the tradition and the emerging reality, the expansion of education. Uh, I hope um, with maybe elements of liberal education and questioning and so on and so forth. That's one thing. On the, uh, what the West can do, I, I would say uh, two things. Number one, uh, well three actually, number one, um, at the level of um, Western governments, we have to strike a better balance uh, between uh, the pursuit of what I think are not now natural and important strategic and economic partnerships between the United States and India, between Australia and India, between Japan and India, the Quad, uh, and Europe and India, all of this, uh, and um, to seek um, new and potentially uh, exciting alternatives to supply chain dependence on China to help construct the infrastructure that would make India a feasible alternative in terms of participation in critical supply chains. Uh, all of this uh, and unnecessary, gratuitous, superficial, mindless deification uh, of um, the ruling party and the, and the current prime minister of India without any critical kind of sense or proportion of what's happening to human rights, press freedom, and constitutionalism in, in India. I personally do not think it was necessary to give Narendra Modi the extremely rare honor of a state dinner, and then in addition, separately, uh, an address to the joint session of Congress, and to completely um, purge from any public commentary any expression of concern about what's happening to democracy in India, a little bit of balance, uh, I think, would be in order. That's the first thing. The second thing is, more exchanges. The more exchanges we can have between Indian society and American society, between Indian students and American students, the better. 
including our students going to India and just a, a deepening of ties. And um, the third thing is, uh, I did it today, it was relatively painless. Uh, anyone in this room can uh, go online to the Caravan website and subscribe. <laughs> At least the Indian rate is only $25 for a year. It's not a lot. It's four or five Starbucks coffees. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it was a little more than that for a foreign subscription. <laughs> right. But that's, that's okay. It's well worth it. Kalyani, you, um, I mean, you obviously research uh, things in India. and you, Is that in itself kind of because you're not media? No. So that helps uh, in some ways kind of being seen as relatively neutral. So just is that also something that helps? I think it does. I think India's, I mean, it's always interesting to me how remarkably unresearched Indian media is, for example. I mean, there's a lot of, for instance, I mean, Chinese, uh, China as a country, uh, particularly because of its space, uh, place in, the, in geopolitics, there's, there's a ton of research about China, about Chinese media, about the relationship of Chinese media and, and, mar and the market, and it's sort of a liberalized media, which, which is state controlled at the same time. India really has been very under-researched. Um, so I think research does help. Um, at least people have a better idea of what is going on and also a better idea of what is going on in the long term rather than sort of, you know, journalism has to be reactive by its very nature. So rather than, you know, just, just, just sort of this happened and this happened and this happened, it's more like, you know, wh where is this going? Because I, I hear very often from people, I've, and I've heard it from friends who are Western journalists, they say, oh, but your media situation is so much better because it's dynamic, it's growing, it's huge. And at the same time, you have to then look at what's going on underneath. So, I mean, to come back to the hope question, not, 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 not so much hopeful. But, but I think research does offer you a way of having a, a deeper understanding of what is going on. And I think that is really important. I think one of the things that really is concerning is, that, and this is something that you see pretty globally, where, where you see a sort of a real, you know, sort of this challenge to what is professional independent journalism. And I think that is really something to be concerned about here as elsewhere, where people just don't think it matters. It's like, oh, I can get my news from WhatsApp, or I, got, I, got, I was forwarded this on Twitter slash X, or um, you know, my friends are, are, are sending me these stories. But there is this, this understanding that you need um, you know, independent journalism um, of the kind that the caravan does, or the kind that News Laundry does, or Scroll does in the Indian context. The one thing that gives me hope is that they're still there. I mean, you know, small or whatever, but that the fact is that they're there. They do have a loyal audience. And you can, you know, and, and I think that is the one thing that gives me some hope. Atosh, I'll have you had the last word before we turn to the audience. Clearly, uh, you know, brave is kind of sometimes overused, but in this case it is. You, you weigh in on substantive issues, you weigh in on the reaction to the, what's happening in Israel, the Hamas issue, you weigh in on the Canada assassination stuff. You, so you don't shy away from weighing in very publicly, and if somebody reads the reactions to your Twitter X, you can see that it's the, you, you take it on yourself to do it. What gives you hope? I mean, wh what is it that's making you want to do this day in, day out? Do you see an India story that is also separate from a Modi story and a BJP story and an RSS story? and a feeling like you have to tell that story? What is it that's driving you and what gives you hope? I mean, sometimes then it's I think, rare for journalists to strip away sort of professional dis distance and cynicism. I mean, I take home from the history of the RSS. It was once a marginal player. It has become center stage in Indian politics. I mean, I personally do journalism about India. I don't just do journalism because India, or that overhyped phrase, the idea of India matters to me. The values, the possibility of diversity, of coexistence, of a large country pulling in different directions and yet staying together. And I think those ideas matter a great deal to me. And I feel that for some of us, it is important to keep those ideas alive. Maybe at some point or the other, they will provide the national alternative that is necessary. And that is what we need to keep doing. Why don't I come to the audience? Um, we have about 
10, 15 minutes, I'll take a few questions. I see a few hands. I would very much appreciate it if you keep the question short and point, uh, direct it to somebody specific so that we can get to a few questions. Shavnam has the microphone and she... Uh, what is the Muslim population in India doing to resist uh, the actions of a government? Are they getting well organized, protesting, making alliance with other parties that are against the BJP? It's a difficult business. First of all, I mean, we are a representative democracy divided into, constitution, uh, into constituencies like the U.S. is. And the Muslim population is dissipated as a minority across the country. It doesn't have local majorities. Minorities like the Sikhs, which have a much lower percentage than the Muslims, but are a local majority in Punjab, are actually able to defend themselves far better. If we had, say, a proportional representation system, the fate of minorities would have been very different in some mm -hmm. senses. Mm -hmm. So it is difficult for Muslims to organize. Uh, there have been citizenship protests that the government has clamped down on. Uh, the very act of asserting certain rights of citizenship has been declared anti-national. Cases of terrorism have been imposed on the people who led these protests. Uh, unfortunately, even the opposition in the current atmosphere is not speaking up for these rights because they are afraid that doing so would label them with a certain label among the majority in the battle between the government and the opposition has become a battle for that majority. The opposition takes these Muslim votes for granted. So at the moment, there is a certain bleak powerlessness staring them in the face. Uh, and politics or society is not offering great cause for any grave changes immediately. Thank you for trying to bring hope into it. I think you failed. It's all pretty depressing. But my question, I think probably for Hartor, slightly, slightly building on Raju's question about um, Western media and the Western media's role in covering India. I was struck recently thinking how in 2014 you'd read an article about Modi, the Gujarat riots would be mentioned in it. You just don't see that context in pieces about Modi anymore. Um, do you think the Western media could have done better in not helping, and, or have they helped Modi to slightly launder the reputation internationally? Um, what could they have done better? And because we're in Silicon Valley, I would love if you could touch on social media platforms as well. You did on Twitter, but if you could say a bit more about the role they played and the kind of the impunity with which this slide is happening. Sure, I actually, that probably deserves a very long answer. <laughs> I'll try to keep it succinct. Uh, one is, I mean, largely the larger Western establishments, I would say that they did not discount Modi's history. There was a certain degree of reporting. What was perhaps the biggest mistake was the spinning of the economic success of India and seeing India only through an economic lens, the constant hyping of the great Indian story that is coming. It allowed Modi to ride to power as a figure who would become this great, somebody who would open up the economy even further, liberalize it, take India to great heights. And this myth continues even today. While on that front, his record is questionable, and those questions are only being raised today. In this, everything that Modi truly represented, as I've told you about what he really stood for, what his aims were, Modi was not looking to open up the economy. He wanted to impose an ideological vision. A new India was what Modi was looking to do. And I think that realization, the understanding of caste and how it shapes every aspect of Indian society, I think it's difficult for any outside journalists to really grasp that. Even more so, I think it is very difficult for external audiences to grasp. Whenever I try and write for the New York Times, I mean, to, in some of these things, the first 400 words of a 1,200 article, word, article are taken up just trying to set the context of what it means to talk about caste. And I don't think people here have yet got it despite the best intentions. You can see your governor has recently struck down a legislation which called for anti-caste legislation in Silicon Valley. It had gone through the legislations. 
but the governor thought there were already existing laws which would prevent this. They don't. Caste is not a phenomenon akin to anything that anybody here has experienced. And these are huge problems in how India is represented. Sorry, and you said that huge other vasas of social media. I mean, the great hope that social media had brought at one point of time of democratization of information, of opening up of people's voices. I mean, on the whole, it's been hugely negative. I don't think figures such as Modi could have enjoyed the kind of success they enjoy without social media. And the question of wealth and resources are also reflected on social media. Political parties which have huge resources also enjoy a huge presence on social media. And so that is very easy to counteract any kind of citizenship presence on social media. Uh, just a, uh, two quick questions. So one is, uh, as somebody who maintains the idea of India uh, like you do and values it intensely, uh, and as a consumer of mass media, what rating sort of would you give the mass media in terms of their ability, their truth telling uh, when they're giving it right now? Do you think it's like a two on ten? And if it's so dismissive, if it's if we should dismiss it as blanketly as that, uh, what is the best way to sort of keep track of of truth telling uh, on the India story? Um, and the second question is just quickly, do you feel that Modi has no idea of India like that might overlap with ours? Or do you think that his idea of India is just the seventh circle of hell? Uh, uh, I'm just curious as to what your thought is. Thank you. Sure. I, first, to start with Modi, I think I've already outlined what his idea of India is, what he believes in. It is not the same idea. It is a totally different conception. I, I, I mean, that that the term India can apply to both his idea and my idea, I mean, is probably the irony of sort of using labels for two entirely separate things. Uh, in terms of the mass media, no, it's done very badly. Two would be a very high rating as far as I'm concerned. It is actually, in a real sense, a rating is negative. I think unless and until your academic uh, need of analysis requires you to look at that media for some sort of critical analysis, the best thing you can do is not go to it because whether you go to it to criticize it or to watch it, its reach depends on the numbers it gets. And at the moment, all it is doing is contributing negatively. I have perhaps not looked at primetime television now for five or six years. I thought at one point of time it would be necessary to understand India, but even what is going wrong with India but it has reached the point where even that is no longer true. It is literally a lynch mob on television that uh, is enabling the government in ways that I thought were not possible for the media. We'll take one last question. Shabnam, you pick somebody. Would the reduction in the majority that they have in the parliament affect or derail or slow down the 12-point agenda that the government has been imposing over the last decade? And second, what's something Indian citizens can do about this so that it doesn't become worse? Look, I, I think any political check always helps. Which is not to say that we will ever go back to, despite whatever people in the opposition, we were talking about this, that we, there is no going back to 2014. Indian society is irrevocably changed into something that it was not at one point of time. Whatever new emerges, even when Modi or RSS are out of power, is difficult to predict. But if the opposition is going to sit back and expect that we are just rolling back to 2014 because there's political change, that is not going to happen. Something has changed in the way that the large majority looks at their own faith and how they see India. In that, uh, I guess what Indian citizens can do is Maybe exercise their choices beyond that. I think as journalists, we know very little other than that. I do think that some checks, some balances can allow for uh, more voices of sense representing the kind of ideas of India that I'm talking about to be heard and maybe over a period of time at least regain some public space. But that's not very optimistic. I'm trying to make the best of what I think is a very bad situation. Well, on that not so hopeful note, um, please join me in thanking Larry Kalyani and more than a